When you think of a particle accelerator, you probably think of a machine like the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, looking for new kinds of subatomic particles. But most accelerators aren't used for particle physics. We're going to find out how to use a particle accelerator to understand materials at the Rutherford Appleton Lab in Oxfordshire. Here, the ICES particle accelerator is used to try to understand the physics and chemistry of materials, from those in the microchips in your computer or mobile phone through to the advanced alloys used in aircraft wings. Here at ICES, we use neutrons to look inside of materials. This is possible because neutrons have no electrical charge, which means that, unlike my hand, they pass through matter almost completely unimpeded. Luckily, they're not totally unimpeded, and in fact, their gentle deflection can be measured, and that allows us to work out exactly where atoms are positioned and how they're moving inside of materials. This building here is called Target Station 1, and it's full of instruments which are designed to analyse how neutrons behave when they pass through materials. All of the machinery that actually does any physics is hidden inside these bunkers with walls made from blocks filled with wax because neutrons are pretty radioactive and it turns out that wax is the best way to stop them escaping into the wild. So where do we get the neutrons from to fuel all these different experiments? Neutrons are normally tucked up safely inside the nuclei of atoms, which means they're pretty hard to get at. The way that we get them here at ISIS is by smashing a beam of protons into a tungsten target, which is behind this blue concrete and steel shielding behind me. The protons smash into the tungsten and create a shower of neutrons, which can then be directed to the different experiments that are being performed around this hall. I want to show you how we get the high-speed protons that we use for this collision. I'm going to take you to the ISIS particle accelerator. Behind this security door is the particle accelerator. It's a huge circular room, 160 metres around, and it's where we start on the journey to creating neutrons. I asked Dr Susie Sheehy, an accelerator physicist, to tell me a bit more about how the machine works. So Susie, how fast are the protons going in this accelerator? Well, when they come into this main ring of the accelerator, they're already going at about 37% of the speed of light. And then after we accelerate them in this ring, they get up to 84% of the speed of wow, light. Wow, that's pretty fast. Yeah, it's pretty good. What do all these boxes and gizmos and wires do to get the protons going that quickly? So the biggest one that you'll see, the yellow ones over there, are called bending magnets. And all it does is keep the particles going in a circular path as they come around the accelerator. So how about this green box here? So they're called quadrupole magnets and they actually do the focusing of the beam of particles. So it allows us to keep it nice and tightly squeezed down so that we can keep control of it and not lose too much of it as it goes around the machine. And finally, these silver ones, they're quite important, right? The silver ones are probably the most important bit. They're called radio frequency cavities. And when the particle goes through it, it gets a bit of a kick and it gets accelerated. And we've got a few of those around the machine as well. So each time the particle comes around, it gains a little bit of energy. So that after many, many turns, it gains its full energy and gets up to its top speed of 84% of the speed of light. I mean, you know a lot about this, this accelerator, but this isn't your real job, is it? That's right, yeah. I don't know all there is to know about this machine. Um, because what I actually do every day is design smaller accelerators. So what I'd like to do, you probably notice how big this machine is. It's pretty huge. What I'd like to be able to do is to build a smaller machine which can do the same job. How small could your accelerators be? So the one that I'm designing at the moment is probably about 10 metres across, so a lot smaller than this. While physicists like Susie work on designing new kinds of accelerator, large facilities like ISIS will continue to help us to understand how materials work, using the shadows of ghostly neutrons. And this can help us to develop new technologies to make stronger and lighter aircraft, or just to fit even more music onto your MP3 player. At the time the Higgs boson was proposed, no existing accelerator could do the job. This is why the Large Hadron Collider at CERN was built. It has the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator, called the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC for short. Here's how it works. Using hydrogen with the electrons removed, proton packs containing billions of protons are accelerated down a linear accelerator like we saw at SLAC. The first booster accelerates the protons to 91.6% of the speed of light. The protons are then flung into the proton synchrotron. 
They circle here for 1.2 seconds, reaching 99.9% .9 of the speed of light. The protons are then channeled into the superproton synchrotron. Here they are accelerated to the point where they can enter the Large Hadron Collider. Here, there are two pipes that carry the proton beams in opposite directions. Each beam is accelerated to seven tera electron volts. That's seven trillion electron volts. And because they are traveling at each other, the total energy of a collision is 14 trillion electron volts. This ought to be enough to kick the Higgs field into producing a Higgs boson. As the protons approach each other, they are traveling at 99.999999% of the speed of light. The actual collision creates hundreds of particles that scatter out in all directions. Detecting and measuring the trajectories, momentum, and energy of each of these particles is the next big step. In 1964, in order to resolve this problem, Francois Englert, Robert Brout, Peter Higgs, and others proposed a new field that permeated all of space, now called the Higgs field. They proposed that this field contained a condensate of weak charge. A condensate has the property that adding to it or subtracting from it leaves it the same. A particle carrying weak charge could use a weak charged virtual Z boson to move the charge to this condensate without noticeably changing the field. And it could use the same Z boson mechanism to absorb a weak charge from the condensate without noticeably changing the field. This was called the Higgs mechanism. With the Higgs mechanism, an elementary particle that carries a weak hypercharge can oscillate and therefore has mass. Electrons, neutrinos, and quarks all carry this charge and interact with the Higgs field. So they can oscillate and therefore they have mass. Photons don't carry weak hypercharge and therefore they cannot interact with the Higgs field and therefore they cannot oscillate and therefore no matter how much energy they may have, they have no mass. The process is a little different from particle to particle and physicists use subtler concepts of chirality, gauge symmetry, and symmetry breaking, but this is the basic idea. You'll note that the particles that interact with the Higgs field are not slowed down. The Higgs field is not like molasses. If the Higgs field slowed particles down in any way, objects in motion would no longer remain in motion. This is not what we see in the real world. Here's one more important idea about mass. The reason the masses are different for different particles is that the coupling strength of the interaction with the Higgs field is stronger for some particles than others. Increasing the coupling strength is like increasing the stiffness of the spring in a harmonic oscillator. It has the effect of increasing the oscillator's frequency. And we have already determined that if we increase a particle's oscillation frequency, we increase its mass. Now we can ask, what is a Higgs boson? We have learned that, under the right circumstances, excited fields generate particles. This also applies to the Higgs field. If it exists, it has an associated particle. That particle is called the Higgs boson. So working in reverse, if we can find the Higgs boson, we'll have strong evidence that the Higgs field exists and the Higgs mechanism is real and the standard model of particle physics is correct. But it turns out to be quite hard because the Higgs particle is very massive, around 133 times more massive than an entire proton. 
it requires a great deal of energy to form one. At the time the Higgs boson was proposed, no existing accelerator could do the job. Okay, so you've all heard about Higgs boson, but what exactly is all the fuss about? We'll explain. Remember this guy? He said everything in space, like you or the chair you're sitting in, has mass. Mass represents the amount of particles in an object. The more mass, the heavier it is. But in the 60s, Peter Higgs noticed that particles don't have volume. They appear empty. So how can they have mass? He said mass is not stuff, but something like a charge. The charge is given to the particles by an invisible field that is all around us. The Higgs field. Some particles react strongly to it and are given a lot of mass. Other particles are hardly affected by it and get little or no mass at all. Mass causes particles to be attracted to each other, thus forming objects, creating life. Without the Higgs field, there would be no mass, and every particle would fly around at the speed of light. There would be, well, uh, nothing. Higgs theory became a foundation for modern physics. Others used his ideas to create more and more theories. Only problem, the Higgs field was never proven, and if it was incorrect, it could shatter everything we thought we knew about physics. So, how can the Higgs field be proven? Well, you need to collide two particles and study the decay and see if it contains part of the Higgs field, called a Higgs boson. But a massive amount of force and some super quick measuring instruments are needed. For that reason, CERN created the impressive LHC near Geneva. The LHC has the power and observatory capabilities to discover a Higgs boson. And recently, that's what scientists at CERN think they found. The discovery could lead to a confirmation of our understandings in physics, or provide us with a clean slate ready to be filled with brand new insights of the universe. One thing's for sure, exciting times are ahead for the people at CERN, for science, and for you and me. Thank you, Mr. Higgs.